this morning when Mr. David gave his sermon, he made me having, he made me think a lot about the word because. That the baptism of suffering that Jesus underwent, that all of this happened because of one reason. It's because, it's because God loves each and every one of us. That's why he did that. He did it so that we could all be saved. But what do you do after you've been saved? Once you've been baptized, once you've repented, you've confessed, and you've believed, been baptized, you've done everything, what do you do afterwards? Well, afterwards, you have to live faithfully. But how exactly do you live faithfully? Well, to figure this out, I want to look at one central text, and that's found in 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to go ahead and read through it once, verses 5 through 7. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. So before we go through all of these different qualities and what exactly they mean and how they're demonstrated in the Bible, I want to look at the verses that surround this in the Bible. So starting off verse 8, right below it. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In John chapter 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them that his disciples are those that bear fruit, and that those that bear fruit are abiding in him. And you cannot bear fruit. It is not possible for you to bear fruit unless you are abiding in him. So if you are not bearing fruit, you are not abiding in Jesus. But not only are you not abiding in him, but you'll be cast out. You'll become withered. You'll be thrown into the fire, he says. We see something a little similar in verse 9 of Second Peter. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. That's what he says it's like if you don't have these qualities. If you're not living this way after you've been baptized, then you're acting like you've forgotten you were even cleansed from your old sins. And so that's just how important this is. So I like how verse 10 tells us how these will impact us. It says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's literally telling us here, if you do these things, you will make it into heaven. If you do these things, you live this certain way after you've been baptized, after you've done everything, you do this, you live faithfully, and that's how you make it to heaven. But he doesn't stop here because in verses 12 through 15, he makes it known to them just how important these things are. In verse 12, he says, I will remind you always of these things, even though you already know these things, and even though they're already established in truth here, I'm going to continually remind you. That's how important it is. And in verse 13, he says, as long as I live, I'm going to continue to remind you. And in verse 14, he tells them that he actually doesn't have very long to live. But in verse, in verse 15, he follows up with that, saying, well, I'm going to make sure that even after I die, even after I'm gone, I'm going to make sure there's still a reminder. They already know all these things. It's already been established in truth. And yet he's going to make sure they always know because that's just how important this is. So now I'm going to go back to the original verses 5 through 7. I'm going to read it one more time. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. At the very beginning of these verses, it says, but also for this very reason. Well, for what reason? To figure that out, we've got to go up one verse, up to verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So he's saying, in order to partake in the divine nature, in order to escape the corruption of the world, you should give all diligence to do these things. But what does it mean to give all diligence? And what does it mean to add these qualities together. Well, all diligence here, what it's being used to say is that you have to 
hastily and earnestly doing it. You gotta be serious about it, but not only do you gotta be serious, you gotta speedily be doing it. You're not, it's not like, okay, this is a serious thing that I can deal with tomorrow. It's a serious thing you can deal with now. That's, that's the way he's saying. He's saying you have to deal with it now. You gotta speedily get on it and you have to take it seriously. It's not a joke. But when he says add to, that can be a little more confusing on what he means. Is he saying, first, I want you to focus on virtue. And once you've completed your virtue, you should move on to learning knowledge. Once you've completed your knowledge, you should learn on, move on to self-control. Well, that's not exactly what he's saying. The word add to is also translated as supplement in the English Standard Version. And to get a little deeper understanding of how exactly we're supposed to develop these qualities, we can look down in verse 8. In the ESV version, the way it states this is, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, the word increasing is the same word that you have for abound in the NKJV. What this word means is it's like you have a cup and you start filling it up with water and it gets to the top, but you don't stop. You keep filling it up, it starts overflowing, but you still don't stop. You keep increasing it, you keep increasing, you keep overflowing, and you don't stop. That's what this verse means. That's what this word means. So what he's telling you in that verse up there is that in all of these qualities, you need to be ever increasing, ever abounding, always trying to get higher and higher amounts of these qualities. That's how important this is. You don't stop once you reach a certain point. You always try to keep going higher. And if you're doing that, then don't you have to be working all of them? Because how could you finish your virtue and move on to knowledge? But also it makes sense because can you be virtuous if you don't know what's virtuous and what's not? Well, you can't. So what he's saying here is you need to be increasing in all these qualities together and they'll be supplementing one another so that you can live your life faithfully. So now I wanna look at each of these qualities. First, I wanna look at virtue. So what is virtue? Because when I hear the word virtue, I can be a little confused. Are they talking about, I need to be, I need to have courage. I need to have honor. Well, what it's trying to say here in the NIV, it's rendered as goodness. And in the NASB, it says moral excellence. I think moral excellence is very easy to understand. So when I think of someone in the Bible who's morally excellent, I think of the person after God's own heart, David. And so I wanna look at a story of David found in 1 Samuel chapter 24. Here, King Saul is trying to hunt down David because God has said that David will be the next king. And Saul doesn't really want that to happen because he wants to be the king. So he's hunting him down and David and his men, they go into this cave for hiding. And Saul just by coincidence happens to go to this exact same cave to attend to his needs. And when he goes in there, David's men begin to urge him in verse four. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day of which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's rope. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's rope. So I want you to imagine that you're here, right? You are David, you've been on the run and you get this opportunity where you can take the crown for yourself. And they're even telling you, hey, the Lord told you of this day. This is your opportunity that the Lord is giving you. But instead of killing Saul and taking the place as king, what David does is he only cuts off a corner of his rope. Well, why would he do that? But not only why would he do that, but why would he feel guilty about even doing that? Right? The Lord literally just delivered him into his hand. Well, David tells his men as a response in verse 6, and he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. David's saying, even though this guy has been hunting me down, trying to murder me, because God proclaimed that I would be the next king, God himself, even though he's doing that, it's not right for me to kill the king of my nation. But... It can be a difficult situation when it's you. And to make it a little more relevant to today, I want you to imagine that you work for the President of the United States of America. Okay, and 
the president all of a sudden finds out that God says you're going to be the next president. And he doesn't want that. So he decides, I'm going to hunt you down, and I'm going to kill you. And somehow, I'm going to have more than two terms, and I'm just going to keep being the president forever. I don't know how he's going to do that, but he tries to do that. So what would you do then? Right? You'd be on the run, and you end up going into this house. You're hiding there with your group, and he comes. He comes to the exact same house. I mean, what, are the, what are the chances he goes there, right? But it happens. And so he's in there. He takes a break. He decides, I'm going to get some brownies. I'm going to get some hot chocolate. I'm going to go to sleep. Right? It's a real comfortable house. And so he does all that. Now, he's completely defenseless when he's asleep and alone and surrounded by your people. Right? Would you do what David did and spare his life? Or would you take what God has already given for you? He said, you will be the next president. So will you take the president's life and become the next president? Or will you leave the president alone? Well, let's look at what David did after he spares him. It says, David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, and called out to Saul, he called out to Saul, saying, My lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. That's would you do that? Like, would you go and bow down before, before the person who's trying to actively murder you? I mean, it sounds like you're about to die if you do that. So it seems like kind of not a good idea. But that's what David does. He goes and he bows down before him. He can easily be killed now, but he thinks that that's what he should do. He is a citizen of that country, and he is the king. So he should bow before the king. And now David tries to convince him, please don't kill me. I don't want to die. And while he's doing this, he references this ancient proverb in verse 13, which says, wickedness proceeds from the wicked. He does this to show him, I'm not a wicked person. I'm a virtuous person, right? And in the rest of his speech, he's asking Saul to deliver him. You know, he's, God had already delivered Saul into his hand, and so he could have taken care of the situation, and then he wouldn't have to rely on whether the king decides to spare his life or not. But instead, he lets the king of the nation decide his fate. He's risking his life when he does that, and that's, that can be a really difficult thing to do. But what happens because of this? Well, because he decided to spare his life, and because he decided to ask Saul to deliver him, Saul actually realizes that David is more righteous than him. And, that, and he even starts to submit to God's will here. He says in verse 19, For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him get away safely? Therefore may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. He says, May the Lord reward you with good. That reminds me of the passage in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11:6 11, says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we can see here that if we're seeking to understand God's morals, right, and we're obeying them, even when it might be difficult, then we will be rewarded. And so that's what we have to do to be virtuous. We have to look at examples in the Bible, like David, see how he reacts to situations, and we have to follow that example. And next up is knowledge, right? You need knowledge to know what's right and what's wrong. You can't be a faithful Christian and be virtuous if you don't know what's virtuous and what's being faithful to God and what's not. So where do we start with knowledge? Where do we begin learning? Well, the Bible tells us. Proverbs 1, 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And in Proverbs 2, we get a little more insight into exactly how we obtain this knowledge. It says, My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So we're told that in order to incline our ear, in order to apply our heart, the way we do this is by receiving his words, which God is the author of the whole Bible. So we should receive his words throughout the entire Bible, and we should treasure his commands for us. And that's how we'll really be keeping that knowledge within us and not just passing through it. 
But we're also told that we need to cry out for discernment and lift up our voice for understanding. Well, how exactly do we go about doing that? Should we just go around shouting for, I want some understanding? Well, I want to look at what Solomon did. What Solomon did was God asked Solomon, what do you want? Right? And Solomon had a lot of options. He could have chosen, I want to have a strong nation that no one can mess with, and I want us to be the wealthiest. He could have asked for a lot of different things. But what he asked for was knowledge. That's what we can do. We can pray to God. We can ask God to give us understanding, to help us to understand the scriptures. And how do people seek silver? How do they search for hidden treasures? If you're a treasure hunter, you're not just waiting around to find something. You're going out, you're earnestly going after it. You're trying to get it. You're doing it the way that Peter said you have to get it. You have to be earnestly going after it. And in Luke chapter 4, we're able to see a demonstration of knowledge. This is when Jesus is led into the wilderness. And Satan has decided he's going to tempt him. And in the first temptation, he says, if you are the son of God, then you can turn the stone into bread. Jesus had been here for 40 days, and he was probably really hungry because he hasn't eaten anything the whole time. And so Satan says, you can have some food if you're the son of God. You know, only if you're the son of God, you can do that. But Jesus doesn't value his physical well-being over his spiritual well-being. He went here and went through these whole 40 days for his spiritual life. And so he t- responds to scripture that shows that his spirituality is more important to him than his physicality. So by doing that, he was able to show that from the scriptures, that's what he was supposed to do. He knew he was supposed to do that. He knew it was wrong for him to be sacrificing his spiritual life for his physical life. But then in the second temptation, the devil changes things up a little bit. Here he says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you simply worship me. That's all you have to do. You can have all the kingdoms of the world. I mean, that's a a lot of power. It's a lot of wealth. But Jesus quoted scripture once again. And by doing this, he was able to not only know that it was wrong, but he was able to show in the Bible that it would be wrong for him to worship the devil. Because a lot of people could just think, oh, well, if I'm only supposed to worship God, then worshiping the devil is not a good thing to do. But by being able to show it, right, he's able to have more than simply some background knowledge. He is able to pinpoint exactly where the Bible says this is wrong. And then in the third temptation, the devil changes things up even more. Here, he tries to tempt Jesus to test God. And he even quoted scripture to back up his point. But Jesus, because he was knowledgeable, he was able to know that what the devil was doing was misusing scripture. And he was able to, and he was able to quote his own scripture to show that what he was doing was not the correct interpretation of scripture, that it would be wrong to do that. And this is particularly, it applies to us particularly because there are a lot of people who teach a lot of different things. And a lot of these people all use scripture. So how are we supposed to know who we need to follow? Well, we need to do that by gathering knowledge. So when did Jesus gather all this knowledge? How did he know all these things? At the end of Luke chapter 2, Jesus is just a little boy. He's 12 years old, and his family goes to Jerusalem every year for the Feast of the Passover. And when they left, he stayed behind, and he was amazing everyone with his understanding. So we know that even just as a young boy, he knew a lot of things. But not only did he know a lot of things here, but we also see in the last verse of Luke 2, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. So even after being very knowledgeable, that wasn't the end. He had more to do. He had more to learn. Just like how in 2 Peter we're told that we need to continually be increasing in these qualities. And if Jesus is our ultimate example, then shouldn't we be doing what he did and continually increasing in knowledge? The next quality on this list is self-control. Well, self-control is pretty easy to understand. It's controlling yourself, right? But it's not always the easiest thing to do. So I want to look at a story that involves a lot of self-control. Genesis 39. 
In Genesis 39, this is when Joseph has been sold by his brothers into slavery, by his own brothers. And he's now a slave under Potiphar. And because the Lord is with him, what he does prospers. And so Potiphar ends up putting him over all of these things because it does really well. It says in verse 6, Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. The only thing that Potiphar was still over was just what he was eating. Joseph was basically the ruler of everything here. And we also learn that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And Potiphar's wife asked Joseph to sleep with her, and he simply refused. Verses 8 through 9 says, Look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. He has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See, Jesus, not Jesus, Joseph brings up a few points here. He says, one, I've been entrusted with all this stuff, and I've been given control over all these things. But you specifically were the only thing kept from me. So how could I betray that trust that was put in me? But not only that, how could I betray God by doing that? See, by giving all of these reasons, Joseph is able to aid his self-control. If he just was like, eh, no. Well, it's, he might have a little more conviction if he can say no, because that's wrong against God, and that's wrong against my master. But we also, we're all tempted by different things, right? So was this a big deal for Joseph? Did he really care? Well, we don't specifically know how difficult this was for him, but what we do know is he simply doesn't say, I don't want to, no. What he does say is that it would be wrong against his master and against God. But she continues to ask him about this day after day after day, and she just does not give up. But he doesn't stop refusing either. And so eventually what he does is he says, I'm going to just stay away from her. I'm not even going to be near her. That way, there's no problem. And so he's doing that, and it's working out. But finally, he gets a direct confrontation in verses 11 and 12. They read, But it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. So even though he had taken precautions so that he didn't have to continually tell her no, she eventually caught him. And even so, he still said no. He demonstrated his self-control many times without fail. The problem that a lot of people might have is they can say no, but can you say no again, and then again, and again, and again, and it just goes on forever. It never ends. What we can see from what Joseph does here, we can do a few things. We can stay away from what would be a temptation just like how he stayed away from her. But he didn't also just refuse here when he ended and just went on with, when he, with the, what he was doing. And he didn't just stay a little farther away when he was doing his work either. He completely left. He just left his stuff behind and he, he ran. By doing that, he completely got himself out of this situation that would even be using his self-control. So his self-control, that's so important. He doesn't want to waste it, so he's going to just completely get out of there. And there's one last thing that I want to look at, though. See, after this happens, he gets thrown into prison because she says that he was trying to force himself upon her. And so he went to prison. And so he was probably pretty mad when he went to prison. But he didn't take revenge on her later when he rose the ranks in Egypt. Right? He probably remembered what happened. and He got thrown into prison because of it. But... He demonstrated even more self-control later on when he didn't do anything in response to this. He told her no, and when he was thrown in prison for something he didn't do, he didn't just take revenge. He knew it was right to do, and he used his self-control to, able, to be able to do that. So then the next thing that we have up is perseverance. Perseverance seems sort of like self-control. They're pretty similar. But what we're specifically talking about when we're talking about perseverance is we're talking about patient enduring. So you're enduring something patiently. And the fact that these qualities are kind of overlapping each other 
actually makes sense because these qualities are supposed to support each other, supplement each other. But to look at a real story of perseverance, I want to look at the story of Job. So in Job chapter 1, he's a very wealthy man. And Satan tells God that he would curse God if he simply had all of his blessings taken away. So God allows Satan to do so, but he does not permit him to hurt Job. And Job ends up losing a ton of things that he owns. He loses his donkeys, he loses all his oxen, he loses all his sheep, he loses all of his camels, he loses all the servants that were with him. But even after losing all that, he lost something that could be considered way worse. He lost his sons and his daughters. So think about yourself, right? If you got a job and you were able to rise the ranks, right? You became, got into a good position, you were making a lot of money, everything was going good for you. And you were thanking God and you were praising God for everything, all the benefits that have come to your life. Right? After, if you were unjustly, your position was unjustly taken from you, would you then just start blaming God right after praising him for all the benefits you received? Well, what Job does at the end of Job 1, we're told that Job does not sin nor charge God with wrong. And in Job chapter 2, Satan wants to go a little farther. So God lets him to hurt Job, but not to kill him. And so Job's entire body, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, he was covered in these painful boils. And so he ends up sitting in all of this waste, all covered in boils, and scraping his skin with a shard of pot. And his wife comes to him and she tells him, you should curse God and die. But then Job responds, verse 10, with, shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? He said, I got a lot of blessings from God. I was very wealthy. I had all these sons and daughters. And just because I have lost my possessions, I should curse God? He showed that that's not the right thing to do. And this is something we could ask ourselves. When something happens to us that we don't feel is fair, say, if good things happen in our life, isn't it only right that bad things end up happening to? But Job had more problems than just this. His friends came to him, and they told him, you've done something wrong. That's why this happened to you. It, this didn't happen because you're innocent. You're guilty of something. So repent, and that's what you got to do. But Job knows that he didn't do anything specific for this. And so his wife is against him. His friends are against him. He's sitting in waste. He's scraping himself with a shard of a pot. But what Job did this entire time was he patiently endured. And at the end of all of this, Job was rewarded with double of what he had before by God. So then our, on our next quality, we have godliness. Before, before I did this sermon, when I thought of godliness, I would generally think that's being like God, right? But that's not exactly what this means. What it means is to have respect and reverence towards God. And while that respect and reverence might cause you to act more like God. What godliness really is, is the respect and reverence itself. So for this demonstration in the Bible, I want to look at Daniel chapter 3. This is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So King Nebuchadnezzar, he builds this massive golden statue, and he calls all these government people together. And there's a decree right aloud. Verses 4 through 6. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. It was obviously wrong to worship idols by the Jewish law. But facing death, a lot of people would probably end up worshiping the idol anyway. However, there were three specific Jews they didn't compromise. And that even shows you how because they had a respect for God, they wouldn't do something that's against God. Because they knew it was wrong to worship idols because God was the only one deserving of their worship. So they can, the Chaldeans, they come to King Nebuchadnezzar and they tell him, there are these Jews that you've set over the province of Babylon and they're not listening to the decree you set. And these three are called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they also tell him, not only do they not follow your decree, they don't even worship the same gods as you. 
So the king calls these men up, and he says, is this true? He also tells them, I will let, I'll let this go, as long as from now on you worship the idol. But the way they respond is by saying, no, we're not going to do that. If you want to throw us into the fiery furnace, throw us in the fiery furnace. And if you don't want to throw us in the fiery furnace, let everyone know that we will not worship the idol. So by now, the king, he was already mad, but then he's described in the Bible as being full of fury. So what he has happened is he has the furnace heated up seven times hotter than normal. He gets these mighty men of valor to bind them up and throw them in there. And for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were far away in the province of Babylon, it might have been pretty easy to say, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, the fiery furnace, that's not like staring me in the face right now. Well, now it it really was staring them in the face. They were about to be thrown into the fiery furnace. But even so, because of their respect and reverence for God, they would not worship the idol. And so they were thrown in. And the mighty men of valor, they died from the heat. But then something quite unexpected happens. The king notices that there are four people walking around inside of the fiery furnace. They only threw three people in, and these three people should be dead. So it didn't make any sense that there was four people in there. And the fourth one was described as like the Son of God. So he ends up calling the three out of the furnace. And when they come out, no one could even tell that they had ever been in there. They didn't have a scent on them that smelled like there was fire. They didn't look like there was ashes all over them. And so then King Nebuchadnezzar set a new decree. He said that any people, nation, or language that speaks against their God would be cut into pieces. And not not only that, but they were promoted within the province of Babylon. The next quality is brotherly kindness. So what is brotherly kindness? Well, it can also be described as brotherly love. But it's not just talking about men. It's talking about all the women and the children too. Everyone that is within the church is who it's referring to. But brotherly love, you shouldn't confuse it with the next quality, love. Because while they're similar, they're not the exact same thing. So for an example of brotherly love, we want to look at a story in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, Saul is going down the Damascus road. And Jesus appeared and questions him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul is struck blind. And he goes three days without his sight or eating or drinking. And Saul ended up believing in Jesus, and he was praying to God about it. And so God decided he's going to send Ananias to Saul. And Saul had already foreseen this in a vision. He saw that this was going to happen. However, Ananias, right away, he doesn't think it's such a good idea. He's like, hey, God, this guy, he's been coming here and persecuting all of your followers. Why should I go over there and help him when he probably came here to persecute all of us? But God tells him, I've chosen him. So he sends him on his way. And so Saul ends up getting baptized, and he starts preaching in Damascus. But then there, a plot arises. There's a plot to kill Saul. And all of the brethren here, even though Saul had originally come here to actually persecute all of them, they risked their lives to get him out of the city. Because if they were found helping someone escape that's trying to be killed, they could be killed as well. But they risked their lives for him because he is now one of their brethren. But then after he leaves, he goes to Jerusalem. Verse 26, it reads, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. He wasn't received as a disciple because of how he had acted in the past. But while it seems that this story is kind of irrelevant to today, the same thing can happen today. People can be in church and they can choose, I want to get baptized, I want to live a different life. And even though they say that, We may be thinking, well, I know who that person is. I've known them for the past three years. They are not a follower of Christ. But we need to accept them as a follower of Christ. They have repented. They are trying to change their life. And we can see how Barnabas does this for Saul in verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Barnabas, he came in, he defended Saul. Saul was kind of like somebody that's new. If someone comes here, no one knows who they are. Well, someone needs to 
introduce them to people. Someone needs to receive them into the church. But it doesn't just need to be someone. We need to be the ones doing it. Each of us need to be doing that. And because Barnabas does this, brotherly love is demonstrated here once again. There arises another plot to kill us all. And the brethren here, just like in the other place, risk their own lives to help him. But this isn't just about people that are new to the church. In Romans 10, 12, we're told, be kindly affectionate to one another, brotherly love, and honor, giving preference to one another. The last quality on this list that Peter tells us is love. And one thing I want to point out is Peter told us this is going to supplement this, and this is going to supplement this, but the end of this big chain is love. Love is what supplements all of the other qualities. So what kind of love are we talking about? Are we talking about you have to love your pets, and you have to love your family, and that's what you got to do? Well, that's not the exact type of love he's talking about here. He's talking about what you call agape love, which is a type of love that you give undeservingly. You give it unselfishly. You give it unconditionally. And it doesn't just apply to certain people. It applies to everyone. And there's a really famous story of love in the Bible. And that's Jesus coming to the earth and dying for us. See, at the final feast of the Passover, in Matthew 26, verse 21 says, Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. So he said the final feast of the Passover, and he's telling them, I know that one of you will betray me. But a while before this, he also told them, I'm going to die. Right? And at that time, Peter said, well, that's not good. We can't have you die. You're the Christ, right? You're supposed to inherit your kingdom. We can't let that happen. But even though Jesus was the person who was going to die, he, told, he rebuked Peter. He said, no, I have to die. That's according to the heavenly plan. It's, it would not be right if I didn't go and die. See, but we find out that not only did he know that he was going to die soon and that one of them would betray him, we actually find out that he knew exactly who was going to betray him. In Matthew 26, we're told that Jesus asks him, is it I? Am I the one that's going to betray you? And Jesus tells him, yes, it's you. You're the one who's going to kill me. Well, betray me. And then I'll be killed. So, The thing that I really want to focus on here is even though Jesus knew exactly who was going to betray him, he didn't treat him differently than all of the other people. Even though he knew what this person was going to do, he didn't treat him any different. He allowed himself to be taken when they came to the Garden of Gethsemane. But we know he didn't want to be taken. He was praying for that not to happen. But why would he allow them to take him? Well, he did it because it was his father's will. But why would the God of heaven want to send his only begotten son to the earth to suffer and die? It seems like it wouldn't really make sense. I I wouldn't want to go send someone that I care about to go die and suffer. That doesn't doesn't sound good. Well, we're told in Romans 5.8 that... He did this because he loves us. It reads, But God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't send Christ for the people who were living right. He sent it for all the people who weren't living right, for all the people that were betraying him. That's who he sent Christ for, to save them, to hopefully save them, to ask them to please come to him. And here, the same word, for love is the same word that's used in Second Peter. Because there's different words I use for love. But this is the same exact word. And this same exact type of love is what we're expected to have. In Matthew 5, 44, Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Even though all these people are doing these bad things against you, you still should have this type of love for them. Because that's the type of love that God showed towards us. In 1 Corinthians 13, 3, we learn a little bit more about this type of love. It says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. 
So just doing something isn't enough. Just because you may give a lot of money, just because you may sacrifice your own body, that may not be enough because you have to have love. And the next few verses in Corinthians really explain what this love is. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. In verse 8, we're also told that love never fails. And this is the kind of love that supplements all of these other qualities. But Jesus, he didn't just come here. You know, he was, he didn't just randomly end up here. He was sent so we could be saved. As we've seen in Romans 5, 8, he was sent because of the love of God. And in Mark 16, 16, we're told that we have to believe. In Acts 3, 19, we're told we have to repent, which is a change in our mind, which causes a change in our actions. We're told in Romans 10, 9, that we need to confess our faith. In Romans 6, 4 through 7, we're told that when we're baptized, we're not simply baptized in water, we're, we're baptized into Christ's death. And that who we were before is crucified. And we have become free from sin. We're no longer a slave of sin. And in Revelation 2, 10, we're told that if we are faithful until death, then we can receive the crown of life. So if there's any way that we can help you this Sunday evening, please come to the front. Together we stand.